I began my project as a study of several artists' work, and uh, Piper was among those art was one of a number of artists I was interested in. With Piper's work, I found there was a moral question that was central to, uh, it was an important moral question about who we think we are and how we treat other people. It's this piece called Five Unrelated Time Pieces in 1968. And it's a piece that begins simply enough. Uh, she documents it in a series of photographs. In the first photograph, we just see a pound of hamburger meat. Uh, the next photograph, four hamburger patties formed on a plate. And then we see another photograph of the patties frying in a, on a stove. And then the fifth uh, unrelated element comes in uh, her boyfriend. And we see photographs of him eating the hamburger patties until the final photograph where he's done. When Piper writes about this piece afterwards, she retitles it Meat into Meat, suggesting a completely different um, idea about the materials she's working with. And when she retitles it, she writes about it as, an ex as a process where she begins by trying to document her boyfriend, you know, making these hamburger patties, her boyfriend eating the patties. And, uh, but as the piece goes along, it starts to go awry. Things aren't going right. Her boyfriend objects to her taking photographs of him. Uh, her boyfriend objects to being put on a stage, in a sense. And um, slowly, you know, as, she as she reciprocates, there becomes an argument. And afterwards, she seems to sort of reformulate the piece so that it's not just about you know, five unrelated things, the four hamburger patties and her boyfriend, all objectified. It's about how she has objectified her boyfriend, um, what she's done to him, in a sense, by make, forcing him to perform for her camera. And I see in subsequent work, I see her um, turning that around so that viewers of her work have to start asking how, what, how we treat other people, how we judge them, what we think of them when we meet them. So she begins a series of performances in 1970, for example, that she calls catalysis, right? so suggesting a confrontation between people that um, causes some kind of reaction where she dresses up in crazy ways and walks around the streets of New York. Um, for example, in one of the pieces, she soaks, a, um, she soaks a shirt in raw eggs and vinegar and other vile things for a week. And so after the shirt is really rank, puts it on, rides the New York subway at rush hour, goes to a local bookstore that she likes to shop at. Um, and uh, you know, when I talked with her about this afterwards, she talked about this as an experiment um, tried to see what it was, how people would react to her as a homeless person, right? How do people try to ignore the homeless? Um, even when we make a spectacle of ourselves, you know, how do people try to avoid noticing? And so uh, in another piece, for example, that she had a friend document with photographs, um, another catalysis piece, we see her waiting at a bus stop with a towel stuffed in her mouth. And then in the other photographs, she's riding the bus with this towel hanging out. Her cheeks are bulging because they're stuffed full of towel. And everyone on the bus seems to be turned away from her, trying their hardest not to engage her. Right? They don't want her to talk to them. They don't want to get involved. Uh, and the piece, you know, in that sense, seems to be about how we, um, how we denigrate other people by ignoring them, how we make other people invisible through our judgment of them. Uh, she goes on to develop this through the sequence of works to address all kinds of other issues. Like there's a piece where she goes to the Metropolitan Museum of Art dressed really super femininely, as one interviewer puts it, when talking about it with her. She wears a, a short skirt, high heels, puts her hair up. And so as men approach her in the Metropolitan Museum, she describes the experience of, you know, they're asking a question of her, and she turns around to talk to them, and she's been chewing bubble gum and blowing bubbles all over her face. So she's, her face is covered with bubble gum. At least this is how she describes it. And I'm probably imagining some of this too. But there are ways then in which this is about you know, what makes us uh, appealing to each other, uh, what attracts us to each other, and on the other hand, what repulses us. What kind of behavior is, is considered completely un unacceptable beyond the pale. Uh, and so there are ways then in which um, when Piper represents these performances, either through photographs or through written texts, there are ways then in which we encounter them, whether it's in an art gallery or in a book, uh, where we have to start, stop and think about how we would judge this person. What would we do in this situation? Um, and my, the way I interpret these pieces is that they're designed to make us stop and think and to consider what the implications are for our own day-to-day -day lives. 
um, how do we treat other people? What do we expect of ourselves? Um, right? How we respond to people is all, always all about how we expect other people to behave. But how do we expect ourselves to behave? How do we show respect for each other? And I see this developed further in uh, one of Piper's most famous series of works, her Mythic Being series, where she dresses up in a number of uh, photographs. And in fact, she begins with photographs in which we see her altering her appearance. Um, she adds, she turns her hair into an afro, draws a mustache onto her face, uh, puts a cigar in her mouth, and puts on sunglasses, mirrored sunglasses. She becomes something that, uh, through thought bubbles, uh, she adds, uh, something that seems to express our sort of our worst fears of who we might meet on the streets. Of course, she's doing this in the early 70s at the height of black exploitation film uh, in the sort of waning years of uh, the Black Panther Party and other aspects of the Black Power Movement. Uh, so there are ways in which she's addressing really specific circumstances of that time, the popular culture, um, uh, underground politics, left-wing politics. But there are ways in which she also brings this work into everyday life, too. Um, in a, some of the later mythic being works, we see the mythic being based on photographs made of Piper that she's altered, that she's drawn on, that she's painted on, in which the mythic being becomes this, um, on the one hand, a really contemplative figure. So there's a series uh, called The Mythic Being, Let's Have a Talk, where we see the mythic being sort of sitting at his desk with his feet up, the sunlight raking in the windows as he must think, probably thinks deep, uh, deep thoughts. And then, but then uh, he begins to engage with us. He looks out at us in the next images. Um, he has a speech bubble where he starts to ask us uh, to suggest, you know, let's have a talk, uh, like, like people, like good friends do. But then he turns it around and uh, with a, a, you know, crossing a line, says, let's have a talk like close friends do. May I stroke your back? And suddenly in the last image, he's at a distance. He's far off. Um, the words have come, but physically in the image, come between him and us. Suddenly, friendship has become a sexual advance, um, an idea that she develops further in other of the mythic being works, where uh, the way in which we treat, e treat each other uh, seems always to verge on taking advantage of each other, uh, where friends seem always to be crossing lines or always thinking about crossing lines. Uh, the mythic being pieces are, um, you know, they're full of sexual tension, many of the pieces. Uh, and when Piper writes about them, and she always uh, writes about these pieces to present, when she presents them publicly, she writes about them as, on the one hand, an opportunity for her to explore what, sort of, uh, what sorts of freedoms she might have were she a man. You know, sexual freedoms, freedom to walk the street without being ogled, that sort of thing. But on the other hand, she also presents them as dilemmas. Uh, right? How do we, how do we, uh, how do we take responsibility for our behaviors? How do we treat our friends? Uh, again, it comes back to the big question of respect and judgment. And I think that's where Piper's work is most powerful. When we begin to think about what it means for us, uh, how it applies to us. One, uh, one goal I have in my book is to try to talk about Piper's work in terms of the ways in which her work addresses the viewer and makes the viewer take responsibility for what they see in the work. And I um, try to make this point really early on in the book because many people have written about Piper, write about the work as if it's just about Piper, as if it's only an expression of Piper's you know, inner being, of her true self in some way. And uh, I see her doing something very different. So for example, there's a piece I talk about early on in the book called Cornered, where Piper speaks to a video camera, much as I'm speaking here, and uh, addresses the viewer um, in a setting where she's you know, removed by the distance of video. She's, uh, the video monitor is always positioned behind a table with its legs facing out towards the viewer. And the viewers are arranged, are seated on chairs that um, are arranged in a triangle pointing towards the monitor as if the viewers are getting ready to attack Piper, getting ready to mount some kind of military assault. And I think it's important that she you know, demonstrates her distance, her separation from the viewer, in order to remind people, to remind us, that when we see her work, it's not just about her. 
that it's also about us, right? Will we be so incensed when she talks about uh, questions of our own racial identity that we want to attack her? Um, does the video provide sufficient protection for her? And you know, why would we, why would we ex get angry with her when she's expressing sort of commonly held ideas about race?